hello, and welcome back to another episode of the 2020 Podcast, bringing clarity to business, entrepreneurship, and life. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here. I am your host, Dr. Harbir Sayan. Before we jump in, don't forget to always subscribe. Please leave a comment, leave a review, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Always appreciate all the feedback that you guys provide. I have an amazing guest here today, Dr. Ritesh Patel from CNB Scene Eye Care in Ontario. They have two beautiful locations. Actually, I'm not just saying that if you guys check it out, really amazing decor and beautiful locations. Award-winning practices voted the top three optometrists in Toronto over the last five years running. Uh, Dr. Ritesh Patel also lectures to uh, family practitioners and the Ontario Pharmacy Association. And my favorite fact about Dr. Patel is is that he was the official optometrist of the Cincinnati Bengals from the year uh, 2008 to 2010. If you know me, I'm a huge football fan, so I got pretty giddy just learning that fact. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Patel, for joining me here. I really appreciate you being here on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the audience for uh, listening in. Dr. Cyan is uh, is an amazing, um, you know, showcase of optometry and, and young entrepreneurship. So I'm thankful to be here and thankful uh, for you to have me. So I look forward to sharing uh, some of these thoughts, ideas. It's Super Bowl Sunday, so I guess the football um uh, uh, note is uh, is very relevant today so thank you very relevant yes okay we, you're gonna be whoever's listening is listening after super bowl but we're recording just a few hours before kickoff so definitely the the football fact is very relevant but thank you dr patel appreciate the kind words why don't we jump right in tell us a little bit about your practices so you have two locations um in the toronto area um what's your like how do you feel how would you describe yourself as an optometrist what do you like to do what's your favorite part of the practice yeah, so I've been one of those lucky few that uh, somewhat knew I wanted to be an optometrist since I was a, a very young child. So, um, you know, breaking glasses every other every other visit, uh, my parents dragging me in, going through the process of, uh, you know, what it is with a minus uh, five with three sill, high astigmatism type of kid, and rambunctious enough to break them, uh, break my glasses constantly. So I was, I was uh, one of those things that the only way you can uh, figure is if I can't beat them, I got to join them. Uh, and the only way it was, uh, it would make sense is if I actually had the ability to <laughs> be able to harvest my own eyewear. So, um, you know, fast forward, following my passion, following, uh, you know, the, the, the lines it takes to become an optometrist, I was fortunate enough to be able to just kind of do that. And I, that, I think that's, uh, planted a really important seed for me very early on, uh, in terms of just following my passion. So, uh, you know, when it became uh, a point where, you know, after graduating from school in Boston, um, I practiced in Cincinnati and Kentucky, and as you mentioned, was uh, one of the doctors for the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, it was pretty cool, and uh, part of all those experiences kind of taught me what it was like to be able to care for people um, and really dive deeper into what uh, allowed me to follow my further dream of, of kind of becoming that much more focused on dry eye. So, um, you know, for us having our own practice since 2013. It was pretty incredible being able to help people for sure, but then really kind of diving deeper into some of the passions of optometry uh, and dry eye and, uh, you know, investing in technology, which I'm sure we'll chat about a little bit more like LipaFlow and IPL. That was, that was, that's been the fun part for sure. For sure. And we're definitely going to jump into that. Um, also want to give a shout out to Neko as we have our, as I have a fellow Neko alum here on the call. Um, go Neko. All right. Um, Actually, you know what? I had uh, Dr. Um, Howard Purcell, who's the current president, on, and that was a bit of a rah rah conversation, too. Like, yay, make good. Anyways, um, <laughs> you mentioned dry eye. So, you know, of course, that's going to be anybody who follows me or listens to me knows that I talk a lot about dry eye these days. I've tried to document my journey into dry eye, um, into the dry eye sphere, kind of like as a beginner. You know, what, what were my steps? How do I get into it? But I'd love to hear your version of that journey. Um, you know, when did you feel like dry eye was a, a, a specialty you wanted to go into and were there certain triggers or moments, milestones, however you want to put it, that you feel that you, you know, led you along that path? What's up guys. I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, iMed Pharma. iMed is a Canadian company that provides a complete package when it comes to dry eye treatment solutions, including ocular hygiene cleansers, diagnostic tools, treatment devices, such as their IRPL and of course, eye drops. In particular, iMed is proud to offer their latest and greatest artificial tier, the iDrop MGD. 
a long-lasting premium quality eye drop for evaporative dry eye patients. iMed eye drops are only available through eye care professionals, not in retail stores or on Amazon, which as you know, is something that I believe is very important when we're building a dry eye practice. To learn more about iMed Pharma, contact your local iMed rep or visit imedpharma.com to learn more and see the difference. And now back to our episode with Dr. Ritesh Patel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I very much vividly remember the point where uh, I think we all do, where we got your first hug from a patient. Uh, and uh, it was an incredible feeling for me. So uh, this goes back to when I was actually practicing in the States. It was Kentucky and I had a patient uh, that was uh, impacted greatly by her dry eye. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to help her out, got her started on, uh, you know, a treatment protocol. And I remember seeing her uh, six, um, six weeks or eight weeks later, and she came in and before she said anything, she just gave me a big hug. Um, and it was just her being genuinely thankful for uh, someone being able to help her because as in her own journey, she had gone through different practitioners and just kind of came up with the same roadblocks and same um, end result of not feeling necessarily any better than she did before. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't think I did anything special besides just listen to her concerns and come up with a plan. And, and, and I think that really just helps people who are not being very hopeful, get them on the right track to be able to get there. Um, so that to me was a very vivid memory of not just happens to be my first hug as a patient, but happened to be a dry eye patient specifically. And I think at that point, it was a very big seed that was planted in me in terms of just, you know, the true nature we have as, as physicians, as doctors, they'd be able to, to help somebody. And it happened to be one of the few months that I had just simply graduated. So it was really much aligned with, you know, right after uh, finishing school in, in, uh, in ECHO or NICO and, um, and be able to kind of have this experience with the patient and then in turn be able to kind of take that a step further and just continuously help people. So that to me was a very, very important thing that it just kind of drove my, uh, my passion for dry eye. That's amazing. Uh, very few hugs going around these days, unfortunately. Yeah. Whether, whether people are appreciative or not. Uh, but I, I definitely, you know, uh, definitely it's a very special feeling when a patient gives you that kind of acknowledgement and, and praise and you know, love that you've, you've given them some kind of relief that they haven't had before. Um, that would definitely encourage you to pursue that path. So what were, you know, when you, when you dive deeper into dry eye, then what are some of the, what was the first what, that you would consider advanced piece of technology that you brought in and what convinced you or, or made that what was that encourage you to go that step to bring that in, instrument in? Yeah, so I was uh, fortunate enough to practice alongside when I moved back to Toronto, um, alongside an ophthalmologist who was in refractive eye care. And uh, one of the things that I was brought on for was to actually develop a dry eye clinic. So, you know, fortunately enough, we were actually the first, I was the first practitioner in North America to utilize Lipiflow, actually. Um, that's a very, so, that's a pretty big, unique claim to have as well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Health Canada actually approved it before the FDA. So we just had access to it. Um, and again, the same story in terms of being passionate about dry eye, it kind of was a very symbiotic fit for, uh, you know, myself, the practice I was at. Um, and so Lipiflow was really the cornerstone of dry eye um, care for many years and, and quite frankly still is. Uh, you know, for anybody who's been around for 10 or 15 years uh, of practice or longer, you know, for many years, you really had no choice. It's like, okay, here's a drop um, and see you in a year. And that was pretty much the end, end of, uh, of any sort of dry eye care that you had for those patients. And now I'm seeing patients that I'm just like, man, if I did that, I, I feel like I'd be, you know, it'd be malpractice, right? <laughs> um, so we're fortunate to live in an age of technology. Dr. Patel, unfortunately, though, we know that there's still, still a good portion of um, you know, practitioners who do kind of don't really care to dig into dry eye all that much. So that is kind of what they do is like, here's a drop, take that, you know, I'll see you next time. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the goal of this is to encourage our colleagues who maybe are not that comfortable with dry eye treatments just yet to kind of get into it a little bit more and, and know that there's some options for them to treat the patients even more um, in depth, you know, sorry to cut you off, but uh, would love for those people to come on board. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the water's warm. So, you know, the idea here is that there is a lot of uh, technology um, in, the, in the realm of, let's call it Lipiflow and IPLs and Blavex. But quite frankly, there's, there's not always a, a complete need for those things. So something as simple as a, as a warm compress actually goes a long way. Something as simple as nutraceuticals 
uh, actually go a long way. So I think that's a great, um, to your point, uh, the idea that we can, you know, practice however we feel comfortable, but at the same time know that these different um, technologies or vitamins or therapies exist in various formats that, uh, you, know, you know, whatever realm that you want to practice in, it's kind of nice to have that option. Whereas, uh, you know, not only that long ago, it really wasn't an option. Mm. Um, so to, uh, to just have that flexibility of technology, both in terms of a practitioner or whatever, uh, whatever level that you want to, uh, uh, you want to go at and to know that, that uh, if there is a, a next step that you want to be able to take that, you know, the sky's the limit really at this point, which is really great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's step away from dry eye for a moment. Cause there's a few other things that I want to touch on and we'll come back to dry eye, um, with a few other things, but you, you also do, you know, uh, myopia control, you fit specialty contact lenses and, and all these other things at your practice, um, see and be seen eye care. Um, you know, I, I don't do all of those things. I do some of them, but I find like, if I really want to get um, into it, then I, I'm afraid that I might be taking away from some other, you know, my, my ability to do some other part of the practice, but you do all of those. Do you recommend somebody who wants to kind of get into all of those different things? Like they should, they just dabble a little bit with each thing, or do you think they should kind of go heavy into one, get that set, then go into the next one and get that set and so on? Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's really a wrong answer per se, but I do find that, uh, you know, the old saying that 10,000 hours of doing something makes you, you know, gets that level of expertise. Right. Um, so there is, there is certainly value in terms of, uh, you know, going a little bit heavy on, on something that you hopefully feel passionate about. Uh, and, but sometimes as, as you're an early practitioner, you kind of don't know what you truly are passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes dabbling in those things so you can actually understand your passion um, is one of the biggest things. Now, for me, I was fortunate that dry eye was really something that hit me very early on in my career. So it was something that I continued to follow with it, uh, follow through with. And, um, you know, whether it's sclerals, which actually was a, um, a byproduct of dry eye. So for my patients that want to continue to wear contacts, uh, sclerals just happen to be a very organic fit in that direction. And then it actually, uh, part of my refraction, uh, you know, when I spent my years in, in the, the laser clinic, um, focused on dry eye, there was ultimately just some patients that weren't suited for laser. So to know that they wanted a non, or they required a non-surgical option, really kind of uh, what stemmed me into myopia control slash more so ortho K than it is quite frankly myopia control in my practice. So I think these kind of, um, these slight uh, movements or branches off the, the trunk of our, my tree and it just happened uh, organically. And, um, and to me, I just kind of decided that, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So I'm gonna dive deeper into it and, you know, go to certain conferences um learn about specialty contacts and just and just keep going forward with it so i was fortunate it happened organically but to, to your point considering something where you may want to kind of test the waters dip your toes in um there's no harm in that and i think you know for young practitioners when you have so many different types of patients that you're hopefully seeing then knowing that their solutions or are, are, are um, understanding their solutions those various things kind of allows you to choose your own adventure yeah I like that. Choose your own adventure. I used to love those books. Um, yeah, but, I think, uh, but that's actually really, really great advice. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Because I mean, I still feel like I'm, I'm in, in the early stages of these things. You know, we're getting in more into myopia control. I, you know, I'm probably a little more um, into dry eye than myopia control right now, but want to start to do sclerals and then these types of things. So, you know, it's good to know that a young practitioner or even a more veteran practitioner could sort of dabble a little bit, see how it works, whether it works for them in their practice and start to implement one or the other a little bit more um, uh, heavily. Actually, you know what? It reminds me of a quote from a book. Uh, uh, have you read Good to Great by any chance by Jim Collins? Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. So one of his theories was fire bullets, then cannonballs. I don't know if you remember that theory, but it, it, that kind of, <laughs> yeah. reminds me of that quote, right? You shoot little bullets. Let's test this theory. Let's test that little practice. And if it works, then you shoot the cannonball. Uh, in that direction. So anyways, uh, if you haven't read Good to Great, guys, get out there and check it out. It's a good book if you're in the business and entrepreneurship, which I think you probably are since you're listening to this podcast. All right. <laughs> uh, I digress. Uh, let's get back to dry eye a little bit. So how, how have you, uh, how do you feel dry eye practicing, you know, um, offering more advanced dry eye treatments and things has helped your practice? Has it helped build your practice? Has it helped with patient retention and those types of things? And 
if you can give some examples of how you think that it has. Yeah, absolutely. So I think when you're, uh, you know, in, in the case of dry eye or, or anytime you're really helping a patient um, and somebody sees that, you know, hey, I was feeling one way and now I'm feeling another or I have been listened to, um, I have been cared for, I'm in the right hands, that person is going to, that, that, that person is going to be a loyal patient right? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be specialized or have the most fanciest equipment. You just have to feel, or that person just really needs to feel like they've been heard. Now, fortunately, it, you know, if you do have the uh, options for having equipment like LipaFlow or IPL and so forth, um, I feel like we've kind of taken a steps along the way that uh, when LipaFlow first came out, again, being one of the first practitioners of having that, um, that was, you know, something that, that was really the only thing I had in my dry eye practice for five or six years, actually. Um, and it wasn't until newer technology came out, uh, like BluffX, and I was like, oh, that sounds like a pretty reasonable thing for me to have. And then you realize that, okay, that's, there's a whole subset of patients that I could be helping for that. Mm. And it wasn't until that was, and I was like, oh, you know what, scleral lenses, that seems to make sense. So, you know, as much as we sometimes need to, uh, you know, have this like very much drawn out plan about what the next thing I should get or the next um, piece of equipment I need to invest in, sometimes just having that first, uh, dipping that toe in first and then realizing that how many patients you can help and then let that organically grow as time goes on. So I know you're, you're out in, uh, in BC, I'm here in Toronto. There's an interesting thing about, um, there's, there's a, a company called Strategic Coach. This is coaching for entrepreneurship, so right down your alley. Um, and one of the things they always talk about is progress, not perfection. Mm. So as much as the idea that you want to be able to be perfect for that person, for that one patient or for your practice, the reality would be is as long as you're making progress, and in this case, whether it's use of technology or your own knowledge or learning, um, then that, that progress is, is going to help that patient move further. Um, and what's very interesting is in the example they give is, uh, you know, a flight from Toronto to Vancouver, let's say, is literally off course 95% of the time. Mm. And there's just constant course correction that happens along the way. Uh, and I take that very much uh, at home when I'm, when I'm thinking about practice and even my patient care. It's like, okay, well, one, I want to help this patient and I want them to be perfect. But the reality would be is there's probably certain things I'm going to help them feel better. And those incremental improvements uh, for that patient uh, with potentially the technology I have or not, or just with my knowledge or all of the above, allows that person to get incrementally better as time goes on. And when the next technology comes out, then you know, then you have the option to see if that's something that you want to invest in or if there's a subset of your patients that could benefit it or not. Um, so I think that's an important one to kind of keep in mind is that as long as you're making progress within your own practice and progress with the patient, then that loyalty uh, for that person and how that, how they're able to build your practice, share that same type of experience with your, with their friends and colleagues and family, um, that organically is going to always help your, your practice grow. And that's, that's, you know, no matter what, if you take a digital approach or not, word of mouth will always be the best way to, for you to grow your practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and yeah, you can give people those experiences like you're talking about, you know, patients want to give you a hug because you change their, their life. Basically, you know, they're going to be able to bring new people in. They're going to share the, that um, uh, experience with other people and bring new people in. I, I like that growth mindset. Um, I think that's so important. Um, you know, I've definitely been guilty of it too, where you get caught up in like, you want to like just make it look perfect before you put it out there, but it's really just about being open to learning and growing and failing, frankly, sometimes so you can get better over time, but uh, that's great. So um, tell me about um, how you made the jump for, um, you know, you had IPL, you were the first person, I still can't get over that, you were the first person in North America to use IPL, the first optometrist officially to use it. Um, and then you had that for a bunch of years, that was your mainstay, and then how did you make the jump to IPL or when did you do that? And what was your impetus there? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, being first in LipaFlow uh, and in turn kind of having that base of patients that, that uh, you know, we were, we were uh, helping along the way. And, and quite frankly, some patients were not uh, really eligible for LipaFlow, even if they wanted to. Right. Um, and so we were always looking for the next technology um, as it was coming out to be able to offer to not only our, our subset of patients that, um, that weren't on the floor having, um, you know, benefit from local flow, but certainly from those, those that didn't. Uh, so an IPL came out uh, and was Health Canada approved. We, we basically jumped on it. We were looking at a few different devices. 
uh, and really finding something that was going to, of course, have the have the clinical, um, you know, papers to kind of prove that, hey, this is actually beneficial for dry eye, because there's been some um, certainly off label treatments for it uh, with IPL for some time, but we were we were just waiting for that uh, that approval. I think that was really big for us. Um, and then really looking at something that would, especially in the in the demographic that we're in, but I think quite frankly, most people, that uh, if there was some sort of potential benefit from um, from beyond just a dryness treatment, then that, that kind of combine those two things into one, almost like on a beauty standpoint. I think that we were we were really excited about that. So in this case, we were the first uh, in Canada to have the EI um ipl and and we've had it now for uh i'd say about six months and it's it's been incredible you know we've been able to just really help patients i don't know about yourself um uh we've never i've never seen so many styles in my career <laughs> one of those uh, that have been in the last just non-stop just you know just almost 80 percent of my patients right now just will have some sort of um experience or story about a sty. it's unreal so I think we got fortunate in, in kind of the timeliness of it. So being able to help those patients with dry eye and, you know, have a gamut of different things that we can utilize technologically, uh, whether it's IPL, Lipoflow, Blefax, plugs, sclerals, uh, or warm compresses and, and cleansers. I mean, there is such a wide range of things you can do, which is just awesome, no matter what range of practitioner that, uh, that you are or you want to be. Yeah, you're right about the sty thing. Um, I think there's something about maybe because people are home more. I don't know what it is. Maybe they're on their screens more. They're rubbing their eyes, whatever it might be. But uh, but it's also one of those things that when you when you uh, start looking for something, all of a sudden you start to see it so much more. Um, and that's something I tell people about dry eye too. Like, uh, you know, before I got into this sphere, like a year, year and a half ago, whatever it was, um, I. I it's not that I brought in a bunch of new patients in that period of time. I have, I'm seeing pretty much all the same patients, you know, that I've been seeing, but all of a sudden, like a giant proportion of them have MGD or, or whatever. It's just because I started looking for it. Um, and I wasn't before. Um, yeah. You know, one of the best things that, uh, sorry to cut you off by the, the, one of the first investments I made actually even prior to my lip of flow was an interior set camera. Oh yeah. And, um, and to your said, camera was was actually a game changer. Still is, still to this day, because it's not something that's uh, very common. Um, and the ret, of course, the retinal camera is really amazing. Still to this day, when people say, "Oh my god, that's my retina," I've never seen that before. I'm like, "Wow!" Like you know, that's you know, in theory, not the uh, necessarily the newest technology, but people are so wowed by it. Um, but it still is kind of foreign. You know, they'll say, "Oh, is that my eye?" You know, because it could be anyone's eye. You know, retina wise. But when somebody sees the front of their own eye, um, they're, one, they'll obviously know it's their eye in terms of their color and so forth. Uh, but when you show them, you know, uh, any sort of MGD, uh, any sort of, of, of uh, blepharitis, uh, they're automatically thrown back and like, oh, is that my eye? Because um, they're almost offended by the fact that their eyes look, you know, <laughs> potentially a certain way. Um, so even even basic things like pink weculas will say, oh, this is UV damage and how that links to many other conditions potentially in the eye. Um, and interior side cameras, I would say probably the, one of the best investments I've made in terms of patient care. Um, and it's really neat to really see in this case, I, you know, I'm 13 years out, but um, going back a few years to be able to see before and after images, uh, whether it's, again, you've done a treatment like Bluffx or just have them go home and do home treatment with, with cleaning their own lids. To be able to see before and afterwards, not just how they're physically feeling. A lot of times, even if they're physically feeling the same, but that it, it looks better, automatically mentally that person feels a lot better about it too. Um, so I just want to share that with your with your audience and enter your set camera. It doesn't have to be expensive; it just goes a long way. Yeah, actually, that's fantastic advice. Thank you. Um, you know, I I don't have it, and I've tested out a couple of different ones. I don't have one um, that we're using. I do use like just a smartphone sometimes to take a photo if I need to. But I've gotten in, uh, you know, I often will just use those generic images. But when I did have a camera or I did take, do take photos and show the patient, it's way more relatable for them. Obviously, they recognize, like you said, the front of their eye, they recognize their iris and everything. So they know there's a bit more of a connection to it than a generic image or the retinal image that they've never seen before. So that's a, a really key point, I think, for somebody who's getting into dry eye is to have the imaging like that, you know, basic diagnostic stuff like that without going super high end or complicated myography and non-invasive tear button stuff like that just um you know just getting imagery is, is super key for for getting patients on board yeah yeah no absolutely and compliance 
you know, that really helps in terms of that person seeing as soon as they see, you know, we do a lot of lid cleansers, like, um, you know, it, even if that person does not uh, need any sort of, I mean, not need any sort of, uh, you know, secondary treatment like blood facts and so forth. Um, but, you know, I really try to have the patient relate to any sort of buildup they may have on their lids because you just kind of know that in one way you're letting that person, you're educating that person in terms of what you're seeing clinically. And, and of course, when they see it for themselves, it doesn't really matter what I say, they see it for themselves. Um, and then you're planting the seed like, hey, in terms of a compliance level, if you do this home therapy, the need for me to be able to do some of these other things may not necessarily, they may not be necessary. Um, but if you don't, then at least I'm going to send you information um, and and in turn, uh, at least letting them know that they, that they have technology there. Because patients want to know. They may not need it right away, but they certainly want to know that, hey, you told me about it. Because most of my dry patients are very, they're very astute. They're very sharp. Um, and we're probably about 65, 35. We have 65% of our patients that are referred. Um, so they tend to, you know, have like some sort of baseline knowledge of it, but they're, you know, family practitioner or, or their optometrists have already uh, educated them with. Um, but then they've gone home and, lit, you know, 10 minutes of a Google search on dry eye, you can learn a lot, you know. Um, and so they're coming in with like very direct uh, questions and different therapies that they've done research about even before I've been uh, told them. So, you know, having that person, uh, you know, having those, those uh, different things that you have access to and the imagery for before and afterwards, it keeps that person on the ball about it as well. But what I've found is with any of my, of these treatments is that planting a seed early in that patient is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I have patients that, you know, I may have said something three or four years ago that are now finally coming back. I'm like, you know, I remember you mentioned that thing, Lipaflow, IPL, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think I'm ready for it now. Yeah. Um, so don't be afraid to necessarily, uh, obviously not just educate that patient initially, but just realize that you may not germinate those seeds uh, or those seeds may not be germinated until a little bit later on, but it's okay to plant them early. Absolutely. That's also very good advice. So you don't get caught up in the fact that maybe those patients aren't converting into, into your, you know, advanced treatments right away because the fact that they know about that information, it might uh, become, you know, the, the fruits of that might show later on. Uh, I want yeah. to ask you a bit more about the IPL. So you have the EI from um, IMED um, and it's the, is it IRPL? Is that correct? That's a, is that a little bit different than a standard IPL? Would you be able to distinguish the difference there? Yeah, so it is, um, and that's that's uh, the IPL that I have in my med. What I found, or what we've found, and what the research has found, is the IRPL has a little bit of a pulse therapy um, that um, that allows it to go a little bit deeper to the tissue, and it's five sub sub pulses within the pulse itself. Um, and so, you know, the, we were debating between um, the the IMED or the EI. Uh, versus a couple other instruments and a combination of one health Canada approval um, right off the bat, which was really great. Having the, the history of the studies that they've had was a, a pretty big distinguishing factor for us. Um, and so we, again, we've been really happy. The other, uh, probably the, one of the biggest things for us was just the ability for uh, that specific uh, IPL to go to uh, treat some of darker skin tones. Um, with, uh, with anybody who's familiar with IPL, then there's a little bit of limitation as we get to some of the darker skin tones. Uh, and uh, this was one of the only ones that actually had some flexibility in terms of getting to um, even my own skin tone for that matter. Um, so that to us is one of the, you know, five, three or four different key things that allowed us to say, hey, you know what, this is the right one for us. That's awesome. Actually, that was something I was going to ask you specifically is because, you know, we've been looking into these devices for our office and I, I understood that with looking on that Fitzpatrick uh, scale there of the skin tone, um, you know, there was a limit, but then I've spoken to some practitioners who say, okay, if you really are experienced with a certain type of device that maybe you can push that a little. So it sounds like you're, sounds like you have that ability um, with the EI. So that's good to know. Um, so any other, any other words of, or pearls of wisdom you want to share on the dry eye? You've already shared a lot, so, you know, it's sort of come out organically. But if there's anything else you'd like to share, because then I want to talk about football for a second. <laughs> um, I would say, you know what, to your point, especially when you're earlier on in your career, uh, as probably a lot of your, of your listeners and, and your viewers are, is don't be afraid to just try something. Um, and it's one of those classic lines, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. 
Um, and if we're, we're always looking for, or we're potentially concerned about maybe not um, doing the right thing, that patient, as long as you're describing to them what, uh, what your plan is and executing on that plan and what that person should expect in terms of a timeline, um, they're just gonna be happy that you have a plan for them. So um, that would be is one of the big things I think as optometrists, sometimes we limit ourselves um, and we're a bit afraid uh, or concerned to not necessarily take that, that additional step. Um, so that's one thing. I would say the other thing there would be is, uh, is starting off with, uh, and realizing don't be intimidated by technology. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the dry eye field out there. Again, we, we named a few, um, um, but, you know, retinal, or, you know, sorry, corneal imagers and lipoflow and IPLs. Like you're talking about, you know, a lot of potentially a financial um, uh, outlay, but for me, again, I start off with, with a pretty basic split lamp camera um, and just trying things. And uh, it really just kind of grew from there and your patient base will grow along with you. So don't be afraid to try those things and you don't need all these fancy tools. They help, um, but they certainly are not a, um, uh, a complete necessity a lot of the time. So spending the time uh, to be able to educate yourself, educate your patients, that goes a long way. That's great. Great advice. Thank you very much. Um, the podcast that I released just prior to this one a week or two ago was my sort of entry level beginners um, plan, if you will, to get into the dry eye space. So this is a really a perfect discussion for us to have as a follow up to that. So, you know, learning from someone like yourself who's in um, on a much more advanced experienced position using these types of treatments and, and um, um, I feel good, good that you're echoing some of the advice that I had given in that podcast, but giving now your own spin on it, having practiced in this field for a little bit longer. So thank you for that, um, for that feedback and that information. So uh, tell me about becoming uh, the optometrist for a national football league team, what that experience was like. So you were with the Cincinnati Bengals for a couple of years. Feel free to, if you don't mind, share kind of uh, how you got in there. And I know you, you told me earlier, it was kind of pure luck, but I doubt that that's all it was, but what the experience was like. Being <laughs> exactly. Like. You know, it's, it's really awesome actually. So it, it, to a certain point I was lucky uh, for sure. I feel like uh, luck plus circumstance goes a long way and just being ready for it. So uh, fortunately enough, I was practicing with, uh, with, uh, you know, another practitioner who was, who's been historically, the eye doctor for the, the Bengals. And um, so I was seeing a lot of the, of the, of the players already. Uh, and it just organically led into like, Hey, you know what, this, you know, we're a good fit for each other symbiotically. Um, the practitioner was kind of happy to, you know, he'd been doing it for some time. So he's like, okay, you know, I've had my fun. It's your turn now. And uh, you know, it was pretty awesome to be able to meet uh, some of these players and they're just big kids. They're just nice people, big kids. Um, and man, man, if you get a chance to see a practice facility uh, at some point of the NFL, it is just next level. It is next, next, next level. Some of the stuff that these guys have access to is just, as you can imagine, they're you know very superhuman in many ways. Um, probably one of the things that uh, amazed me the most was um, was many of these uh, you know offensive linemen that are you know for anybody who watches football, their their whole world is arms length away. Um, they don't, many of them actually are, you know, minus ones, minus twos, and that's how they play the game. That's cool. They, uh, yeah, they don't, uh, you know, you would imagine like, oh my God, like, what are you doing, you know, downfield? How do you see somebody that's literally a hundred yards away and they don't bother? <laughs> so, um, that was pretty interesting. And, um, one of the most incredible things was there was a very, a couple of very famous uh, wide receivers uh, there at the time. Uh, one of them very famous at the time. And um, he was monocular. So, you know, as you can imagine, wide receiver, uh, you know, needs to be able to see depth, needs to be able to obviously see distance, be able to catch a ball, you know, literally while jumping in the air, even potentially seeing the spin on the ball to just understand that. And I'm, I'm examining this guy. I'm like, you know, you don't see out of your one eye, right? <laughs> like, how are you doing some of these incredible things that I was literally watching on TV to, to watch him do? And uh, I was blown away at, uh, at the fact that, you know, you know, without having both eyes to be able to judge depth, uh, of course, there's other cues, shadowing, size, and so forth. Um, but for the people to actually understand that, I was like, whoa, like the skill level, as you can imagine, is, is, is just incredible. And, and what your brain is able to adapt to accordingly for that. 
So while you were there, uh, you said 08 to 2010. Um, I'm trying to think about who was uh, the quarterback and who were the big name players. Uh, are you allowed to say kind of who was who's uh, one of the more famous players that you you got in touch with or were in touch with? Well, was, you know, the quarterback was uh, Carson Palmer. Carson Palmer. Uh, Ocho Sanko was another big guy that was there. Uh, he's a wide receiver. Um, so uh, yeah, just you know, some of the, these guys are just super talented. You know, potentially Hall of Fame, um, Hall of Fame status, and just. And also, quite frankly, just nice guys. You know, they're, they're human. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, to, to wrap up, there's always two questions I like to ask every guest. Um, and so I wanted to, to pose those questions to you. Uh, a little bit off script from what we've been talking about. But uh, the first question is, Dr. Patel, if we could hop in a time machine and go back in time to a specific point where in your life, any time in your life where you were struggling, you're having a difficult time. You can share the moment if you want, but more importantly, I'd like to know what advice would you give to yourself at that moment in time? Yeah, so finally, it's, uh, it kind of combines a few different aspects of life, uh, including practice. So this was uh, actually almost, almost to, it was to the month, um, six years ago. Um, we just found out we were pregnant with our first child and um we had just opened the practice not too much longer before that and so we're still in the opening phases of that and i'm a big i'm a big sports guy so i was playing basketball and i broke my leg playing basketball actually and it was a pretty bad break it was like a for any of his sports fanatics it was like a paul george break just not fun and um and again, I had a combination of all these different things, you know, I had, uh, you know, what my goals were with my practice. So there's some, uh, obviously sort of uncertainty there. Um, I had my wife that was expecting her first child and basically I was, I couldn't walk for about three and a half months and in a wheelchair and the whole nine, it was, you know, surgery, surgery. It was a, it was a, it was a pretty potentially dark moment in my life, but, but certainly most importantly, uh, probably the biggest learnings to your point, as you say, and, and as they always say is like, you know, you want to be successful, fail faster. Uh, this is not quite a failure per se, but certainly a little bit more of a, of a challenging time. So I think I'll tell myself, and I told myself this ironically, give or take a year ago is, uh, is, you know, staying, staying calm in rough waters, um, I think is an important part of life in general. Uh, and why I told myself this a year ago was, you know, give or take the start of the pandemic in 2020. And, um, and, I, and I did remind myself about that. And ironically, it was, you know, five years ago at that point. And, uh, you know, we had just opened our second practice. Uh, you know, we actually just had a second child, ironically. Um, and um, all these things were coming to a head and certainly uncertainty and financial and the whole nine family, you know, health, you name it. Um, but you know, what I told myself then, and I'm thankful I did, especially was the fact that, uh, you know, I'm spending time with my family, just relax, this too shall end and, uh, and you know, it'll pass. And although it's taking <laughs> a little bit of time for it to pass, but the, 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 the advice still stays valid, you know? Um, and so just kind of making sure that, uh, when the rough, when the waters are rough, be calm, uh, and especially if you are a practice owner or not, or a leader in your, in your practice in some way or the other, uh, making sure that uh, the captain steers the ship a certain way, I think is important for the team and the rest of your people around you to be able to see that. So that'd be a kind of continued advice I'd give myself, uh, I have given myself, and I would, I would kind of, uh, you know, make sure that the younger practitioners and family people are not, or both of the above or none of the above, just kind of know that with personal experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's a, that's an incredible experience, man. That's, scary to even think about. I can only imagine how difficult and how pain, literally painful that was. So um, thank you for sharing that moment with us. I know sometimes people get, um, don't like to share such painful memories, um, yeah. but thank you. That, that's, that's amazing. They got through it. And obviously I, I assume stronger because of it too. Um, the last question I like to ask, and I think we've already touched on this, I think quite a bit, but uh, I'd like to pose it to you a bit more directly. Everything that you've achieved so far in your career, in your life, um, how much of it would you say is due to luck and how much is due to hard work? I would say, um, I'm not sure if I define it that way. I would actually define it as, uh, you know, uh, a combination of gratitude, uh, being thankful. And, and generally speaking, you, you get more of what you're thankful for. 
Um, I'm very much a believer in that. Um, and so certainly uh, I, I joke around and say I'd rather be lucky than good. Always I say that. So I've been very fortunate in terms of being pretty lucky, but I'd like to myself, think of myself as pretty good. Um, and so, uh, but being thankful, gratitude goes a long way. Um, you know, and, and depending on how you want this podcast to go, right before coming, you know, actually before this podcast, we do a sage clinic, a sage uh, cleansing of our clinic. And we do this every quarter. We, you know, we have a lot of energies that are coming in and out of our, our space. So we do like to be able to do that, kind of uh, steady some of the energies. And so I'm a believer in that. Uh, and I think a combination of, of stuff that goes uh, beyond some of the traditional way of thinking, I think goes a long way. So certainly luck, however you want to define that. But I think gratitude is, uh, I would say, one of the biggest things for me. That's amazing. That's amazing. First of all, I like that you went off the board there. <laughs> I gave you luck and hard work and you picked gratitude. Uh, but that's great. Um, and I, I appreciate the humility, man, honestly. With, with, obviously, you're doing amazing things. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, being that humble, to, to put it that way, is incredible. And really, sage cleansing of your practice, that's something I'm going to, we're going to have to talk about that a little bit more offline because that sounds like something I would be definitely into doing at our practices you're right there's so many energies coming through daily um it's no surprise that you know sometimes your own energy can get thrown off and um you know the way that yeah. you can, can be affected so anyways that's very cool very cool well thank you dr patel again uh you know for taking the time to join me here on the podcast and sharing such incredible insights um about your practice as a whole on dry eyes specifically Thank you for having me. You're such a, a great uh, showcase for young entrepreneurs, young ODs. So thank you for having me and, and thank you for sharing your voice and your ideas and thoughts with, uh, with the rest of the community. It's really awesome. And good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us in the audience, whether you're watching on YouTube, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, whether you're on Spotify, make sure you go check out Dr. Ritesh Patel, uh, check out the CNBC Eye Care and learn a little bit more from them there. Thanks again for joining and I will see you again very soon.